Hi, so um, I'm here today and I'm going to um, try to explain NTSC uh, color and more generally analog video uh, to you guys. Um, I kind of tried to do this the other day but ran into some difficulties with um, my video capture and audio mixing and for various reasons uh, that take did not work out. So I might pull some resources that I drew up during that recording, but um, we'll see what happens. I'm probably going to wing it again. Uh, there's a good chance I'll gloss over lots of things because, well, analog video is really complex, and it's hard for me to really start from nothing and go up. But I'm going to try to make it as simple as possible. Um, I'm starting from the basics. So first of all, we're going to talk about how monochrome video works. Um, how a black and white signal over like a composite cable would work. We're not going to go into like tuners for TV broadcasts because that, that adds a whole other level of encoding and decoding. But um, a raw quote unquote video signal is... Uh, well, basically a composite video signal. So we're going to look at those. I have an oscilloscope here. Um, Tektronix 468. And um, we'll probably end up using that to look at the video signals. What an oscilloscope does, by the way, um, it graphs voltage over time. So uh, y y you know in Spongebob... Uh, well, if you're of a certain age, uh, you know Spongebob and Karen, uh, the, the Plankton's computer wife. So um, Plankton's computer wife, whenever she talks, there's this little fluctuating waveform on uh, the computer screen. And um, when she's not talking, there's just a horizontal line across. Uh, that's plotting voltage as, as it comes out of a speaker, basically, over time, uh, left to right. So... Um, let's say that the oscilloscope is sweeping 60 times a second, then that means that um, every 60th of a second you're seeing a waveform uh, drawn on the screen of that represents the sound, because sound is voltage applied to a wire, basically. Um, but yeah, whenever... So Karen's computer screen, when not displaying graphics, is usually displaying an oscilloscope. So that's just one easy way to think about it, but you'll see what I mean. You might already know all this. I'm trying to start from nothing. Um, so I got some of this set up, but I don't know how great everything is going to be. First of all, I'm going to try turning on this scope. And this scope is a little temperamental, so it might take a couple attempts to power it up. Uh, the computer up here needs to come on and uh, that happens before it'll start showing a trace on the screen. And it, it looks like the computer's not gonna start up, so. Yep, there it goes. Turn it off and back on, and now the computer's firing up. And yep, there's our signal. So that's currently probing from this calibration uh, test point here. I just have my oscilloscope probe hooked onto that, uh, so you can see a waveform immediately. And this is a 1 kilohertz, um, 300 millivolt signal, or roughly. It looks like it's kind of fluctuating a bit. Not sure why that is. It could be a problem with my probe. It could be a problem with the oscilloscope. There's lots of things it could be, honestly. Uh, but that's basically what it is. Let's see if I, if doing that helps at all. Huh. 
These are old Heathkit probes, by the way. A probe is what you call your test lead for an oscilloscope, usually like this. Uh, this one is from a Heathkit. And I was told when I got it, it wasn't the best. But, I mean, this oscilloscope is a decent oscilloscope for its age, and um, it was very cheap, like 20 bucks. So, I'm happy. I'm just glad it still works. A lot of the time the ROMs die. Anyway, um, these haven't died yet, or if they were, they were replaced by a previous owner, not me. So I'm going to switch to channel 2 now. And I'm going to try to put that on the screen. Yeah, this is going to work. Now, I'll see if I can fix the triggering level. I haven't messed with this thing in a while. I'm probably going to do stuff wrong. It's much more complicated than my last oscilloscope, which was from the 70s, like early to mid 70s, and had just transistors and um, one vacuum tube, the picture tube in it, and a single sided circuit board. Um, <laughs> that one I greatly appreciated. Let's turn down the intensity a bit and not burn in the phosphors too much, if we can help it. Uh. There we are. Let's turn that down a bit. This scope is pretty old and um, honestly, kind of flaky. I've not even used channel two until now. Interesting. Very interesting. Now, oh, there we go. So I guess you use that trigger. Interesting. And you set that to channel 2, and it's good. And I set that to channel 2 as well. Uh, let's see if I switch it to TV line. Alright, well, whatever the case, I think I've gotten it to go here, so... Yeah, you can see on the screen, I'll switch lenses. That way you can get closer. Uh, I don't have a digital oscilloscope, unfortunately.
not a true digital one anyway. All right. Here we go. So now, yeah, here we go. So this is, um, if I did this right, this is roughly a single scan. Now it looks like I'm seeing two things here. two different components of the signal, I mean. Perhaps. Oh, that looks better. This snob might be a little bit funky, let's call it. Triggering is the bane of my existence. That's how you try to lock an oscilloscope onto a signal. Huh, okay. Now, there's just too many settings on these things. That's the switch I was looking for. <laughs> Why it plays with an oscilloscope. That's the whole video. Let's put it on channel one, see what happens. Ah, oh, that's looking a little better. How annoying. The volts per division thing seems a little funky now.
Aha. There we go. I got it. All right. <laughs> Probably I'll just start the video here then. All right, here we are. So this is a an NTSC color video signal. Um, actually, this is two scan lines you're seeing here, or like one and a half or something. Yeah, you're seeing too. It's just cut off on the edges. So. Hmm. Yeah, that's real nice. Yeah, we'll be able to see really well with this. So what you're seeing right here is the very beginning of drawing a single line on a picture tube. And the way picture tubes, um, for TVs at least, work is um, they start in the top corner and then they swipe across, then they go down a little bit, and then they swipe across again, down and over, swipe across, and when they're going down and over, you don't see anything because it's black at that point. But when it's doing the swipes across, the electron guns are stimulated and the phosphors are thus stimulated, and therefore a picture glows on the screen. Um, and you see it all as one continuous picture because the phosphors don't fade instantly. So, yeah, for that reason, um, it's just kind of a zigzag across the screen. Um, and it paints 525 lines a second, um, no, per 60th of a second for um, normal American NTSC 60 hertz video. Um, actually, for NTSC, it's like 59.95 or 97, but it's 60 hertz in the original black and white standard. So, at the very beginning of each line, though, there's this thing called the front porch and the front porch is what we call the part of the signal before um we call the sig the part of the signal that comes before the uh what am i trying to say before the actual um picture is being drawn on the screen so Right now, what we're looking at is color bars. And so the way that the color bars are set up, they um, vary in intensity such that if you put your TV in a black and white mode, you can see that they cascade down from brightest to darkest across the top. And um, for that reason, we'll see something like a staircase effect because brightness is indicated in an NTSC video signal by voltage. Um, so every line you're getting this staggering staircase with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different steps. And um, so going back to the oscilloscope, and focusing back in, you can see that the line starts with this dip here, and that's what actually tells the electron beam to um, swipe back to the beginning of the line and then start drawing a picture. Uh, this area here, this little um, section that isn't just a flat line, uh, that isn't there on black and white video signals. That's only there on color video signals. And on color video signals, it's called the color burst. And we'll get back to that in a bit. So, continuing on from there, we have a blanking period after that, and a little bit before that, where 
we have no picture being drawn. And then, let's check the underscan here. Yeah, that's right. Then we should get a series of steps. And... Yeah, so as you can see here, there are about one, two, three, four, five, six. Is that right? No, must be cutting something off. One, two, three, four, five, six. Huh. One, two, three. Oh, right. That's right. Because um, the first the first bar is not colored, and so the first one is more of a line than a box. Um, but anyway, so counting this first line and then looking at the center of each box after that point, it will go um, white, yellow, um, light blue, green. Uh, magenta, red, and dark blue, or cyan probably instead of light blue, but yeah, so there's that, and there's what it looks like on an oscilloscope, and so here you're seeing about f like, eh, roughly three total scan lines, but um, two complete ones. Uh, so each time you see this little dip at the beginning, that's telling the um, TV to go back to the beginning of the line and start painting again. And then the next time you see a little dip, that's telling it to do it again. Um, and then there's a the little color burst thingy down there repeatedly. And there's also all this other information. And this stuff down here is because there's also non-color bar stuff at the bottom of the line. but. We're going to ignore that for the moment, but there's basically the seven steps, which you can see. Um, and well, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yep, seven steps. And so you might be wondering how's the color encoded in that, and we'll get there. First, I'm going to, I might have a way to show you what this looks like as a monochrome signal. So I'm going to uh, grab a cable. Oh, that's right here. Thought ahead. Okay, one moment. I have to hook it up. All right, so now I've got to plug the oscilloscope probe back in. And let's see, do we get anything there? Looks like we're not getting anything there. Okay, I might know how we can do this still. Take this cable, gotta ground it. And I did plug that in, but I plugged it into the wrong one. That's why we're not getting anything. Duh. I'm silly. Well, 
Huh. Still nothing. Oh, there we are. Okay. So now we're hopefully looking at a black and white version of this. Uh, not quite. We're looking at the color information. Let's look at the, let's look at the black and white. Sorry, that took a bit. <clears throat> Fiddly cables. So now you can see that there aren't those same boxes that there were before. And that's because we are looking at a closer to pure monochrome version of the color bars. The color is encoded in those kind of faint bo like boxes that you were seeing. But now it is a consistent staircase with seven steps in it just like I said and there's also this thing up here but we'll get we'll get there um, I'm assuming that that is the big white blot right there that we're seeing because it is immediately between the first two steps in this signal and that's because it's painting every single line of the screen. Uh, it's just happening so fast that it looks like it's all overlaid on itself. But, um, yeah, so you can see there's the stair steps. And um, there's also the dip there. And you'll see there's no color burst. So now if we look close up at the signal, there's the horizontal sink. There's the initial blanking, no color burst. First step, second step, third step, fourth step, fifth step, etc. All the way down. And then we get the horizontal sync again. And then more blanking for the beginning of the line. <laughs> there goes my probe. Looks like my test lead just came loose. All right, we're back. And yeah, so that's um, what the signal looks like um, in monochrome mode. And if you were encoding a black and white signal, that's basically what you'd see. Ah, stupid thing. method of getting a picture signal out of this thing for the black and white signal is to grab it from the S video output on the back of the laser disc player and um, that's actually internally extracting the color signal and separating it from the luma signal so this is actually not still a pure black and white signal but it's basically pure and it's had the color information filtered out as much as possible um, you're probably seeing a ghost of that in the background because of ground termination, but, um, yeah, don't worry about that. So that's the staircase, and then if we go back to composite video, which won't take as long this time.
There we are. Basically, I am um, doing some really po really bad wiring um, to hook up to the S video pins, which is unreliable. But um, yeah, for composite video, there's what this looks like again. And now we have to get into the mystery of how the color is encoded. So, um, and the whole thing lies in that subcarrier signal. So I just zoomed in on the beginning of the line here, and you can see, and you're seeing it, um, you're seeing two here, so it's like a double helix kind of thing, because um, we are actually, because every other line, I believe, no, is, it, is that right? I believe the phase of the subcarrier wave changes every other line, but um, no, that's PAL, that's PAL that does that. What am I thinking of? I don't know. <laughs> anyway, uh, there is a technique you can use in, um, I, I think actually this is the same sort of deal here. It's just, um, I think PAL does a little bit more with it. But, yeah, so the subcarrier is like a 4 point something megahertz signal, I think. Might might be 3 point something. I honestly forget at the moment. Like 4.58, I want to say. And um, that's standardized. It's a different frequency for PAL video, but um, PAL video uses the same kind of subcarrier idea. And then um, after the subcarrier, you get the lead-in. And after the lead-in... Let's actually see how close we can get to that. Yeah. <laughs> we can get really close. I like this scope. It's much better than my old one. Um, yeah, so that subcarrier is just a 3 point whatever megahertz waveform or 4 point whatever megahertz waveform. And once it has used that waveform, um, the TV will lock in on that frequency, and it will say, okay, so, um, so, like, it has its own internal clock, and it will try to match up the phase of its color with the one from the incoming signal, because they could be out of phase with each other, and what that means is, uh, well, this might be easier as a drawing. So let's try that. All right. So now looking on the screen, on the computer screen, that is, Say we have our waveform, and it's something like this. And yeah, I know it's not perfect, but whatever, you know what I mean. And then um, the TV uh, has its own internal wave generator. Let's change the color. And its own internal wave generator, at the same time, looks like that. So that's because they aren't starting at the exact same point as each other. And so the distance between these two is called the phase shift. And um, the shift can be up to 90 degrees out of, well, no, it can be 180 degrees out, but at 180 it just goes back to being the same thing, but off by an entire wave. So we call it 90 degrees when it is absolutely inverted, so that would be like uh, this. Or, ah, that last one's bad, but ah, paint problems.
yeah, more like that. Then, um, yeah, that's called 90 degrees out of phase. And there's something, a circuit inside the TV called a phase lock loop, which tries to correct the internal TV's timings so that they match up with the uh, incoming signals. And it has to do that regularly, like all the time. Otherwise, it will slowly drift back out of phase. Um, for the same reason, no, no two clocks ever have the exact same time. Even if you sync them up so that they're right, um, they'll slowly drift out of alignment. It's the same way as with that. Um, so every single line that subcarrier is broadcast, and the subcarrier wave gets locked onto by the TV, and its own um, the frequency generator is set up to match that. So going back to the oscilloscope, that's what's happening here. And the TV locks onto that. Then um, after that, something else interesting happens. And that is, let's see, can I get this? Yeah. The color has to be encoded. But the way the color gets encoded is they overlay that same uh, 3.8 megahertz or 3.5 or whatever it is. I forget. Um, they overlay that same signal on top of the black and white signal. And so that's why you see this, the stair steps here have the... Um, well, there's still clearly a stair step because the center of each one is still like a stair, but they're clearly, um, they clearly are showing some waveform activity. And let's see, how would I best display that? So what would happen with a black and white TV showing like a solid, like red screen, for instance, you would have this overlaid color on top of it. And so you get a sort of checkerboarding pattern. Oh, and that's why the phase alters every single time, actually. I, I know how that's. But um, let's see if I can find a picture of it, because this TV will make it a little bit tricky. No, actually, I can do this. I'll just show it on my CRT. One moment. So now we switch over here and we switch it into that mode. So you can see here that um, there's some checkerboarding in the picture. And uh, let's get the camera closer. That checkerboarding pattern is not there on a pure black and white TV signal. So if I were to switch it over to the one extracted from S video, it would look more like, eh, here we go. Let's, let me switch it over. like that. And you can see how the checkerboarding is gone, basically. Now um, I'm going to switch back. Maybe I'll run uh, another cable so you can see both A and B really fast next to each other.
There we are. So now, there's the checkerboarded version, which is what a pure black and white TV would see. And here's what a color TV would see if it were sent the same thing, because it is actually applying a filter that cancels out the information and um, detects it as a color signal. So if you turn the tint control, or the color control, the saturation all the way down on a color TV, it sees it differently. But you'll notice that this one little vertical stripe here and this one little vertical stripe here both still have a checkerboard on them. That's because of errors where luminance information and color information get confused. So the TV is actually seeing a shift between two different, drastically different colors. And I think they're basically completely out of phase here. Um, yes, they're completely, like, you can see how on this graph they're diagonally across from each other. So because they are that dramatically opposed to each other, you see a very strong checkerboard pattern there because the TV takes a second to catch up and realize, oh wait, this is actually a color change, not a brightness change. But by that point, it's already drawn up to there, so it can't just go back quickly and erase that and fix it up. But um, yeah, so a black and white signal and yeah. So this is what black and white TVs would see, which is perfectly acceptable when you're kind of standing further away from it. And especially with live action stuff where you're not just looking at solid colors all day, it's hardly noticeable. And um, you might have also noticed that there's a slight sharpness difference between these two. And uh, that's because... Um, a color video signal actually has less um, horizontal um, color information than it does brightness information. And so overlaying the blurrier color image on top of the higher resolution brightness image results in a little bit of blurring. But in any case, that's... Um, and to do this, I connected the, um, and you can do this at home if you have a TV that has a component video input on it, or an S-Video one if you want to do some custom wiring. Um, but with a component video input on a TV, if you plug the composite video signal into the, um, well, the green plug, the um, Y connector, uh, the Y there is actually um, like a gamma sign for brightness. Um, but the Y in YPBPR is just the monochrome picture signal. And then the PB and PR are actually color components that get encoded in NTSC video. Um, but they're being fed in separately from the brightness information so that they don't have to be combined and then re-separated, which is hard to do with analog signals perfectly. <laughs> I don't think it's even possible with anything we've done except in some specific situations where you can kind of cheat and make assumptions. But, um, yeah. So you can do this at home with a component video signal TV. Just connect a composite signal into the component input and switch to the component input, and you'll see this. And that's what a black and white TV would see. But, yeah. Hmm. <laughs> So, going back to the oscilloscope now. We can see that that stair step from before gets translated into this thing. And in this, this waveform is running at the same frequency as the subcarrier wave. But it's just being overlaid on top of the picture signal. And the way that color is encoded with this is really clever. Um, and it's amazing that they had analog electronics to decode this in the 50s. But, um, yeah, so I drew this out for my first video attempt. Uh, I'll show you what the actual color space looks like. Uh, Oh, 
Oh, that one has the trigonometry on it. That's nice. <laughs> this might actually do the explaining. Oh, this is nice. Someone did a pretty good um, description of how it works. Anyway, um, the thing that you will see in the Yaku color space picture is that there's kind of a grayish area centered here. Uh, and then if you go off to one side, you get some color. You get different color on different side. And actually, it looks like my picture might have been YUV or something instead of YIQ. Uh, they're, they're similar but different. <laughs> um, yeah, so it looks like I was actually doing like the PAL format, but uh, it's close enough. It's basically just a rotated version of the same thing. Um, oops. Yeah. And mirrored, actually. <laughs> So it's mirrored and rotated a bit, but it's all the same thing. And in both cases, gray is at the center, and then the colors get more saturated as you move out to the sides. And um, so if we have 1.0 as for X and Y as the absolute maximum saturation, um, so the most shocking pink possible would be at X equals 1, Y equals 1. Um, then we can think of it like a circle. And I'll go back to the YUV now because that's what I drew. But um, so because you might remember how this is a 90 degree phase shift here. Um, so on this graph, what you would do with that is you check the amplitude of it. And that becomes the hypotenuse of an invisible triangle. So. Um, Let's say that the amplitude is like uh, roughly like 0 0.6 out of 1 or whatever it would be. Um, one point, out of 1.44 because, well, sorry, I'm getting very geometry brained here. Um, with a right triangle of equal sides lengths, I believe um, it's once it's... Um, like a squared plus b squared is c squared so 2 the square root of 2 is I think 1.44 um, huh. all right Uh, 1.41 okay whatever um, so if we had the if we wanted the absolute maximum value for like our orangish color that would be um, about 1.41 for the hypotenuse length um, of a triangle and then uh, you need still you only know the hypotenuse so you have to kind of spin it around the circle to find the exact um, color that you're looking for once you know the intensity. So the intensity is um, kind of, uh, the intensity gets determined and then you check the phase of the thing. So, and by intensity, I mean amplitude. So you might remember how some of these, um, some of these waveforms look much taller than others despite being just like apparently similar on um, the TV screen and I mean and you know the brightness descends but the brightness does not seem to equate to the tallness of these boxes here so um, that's because it's actually the saturation of the color that's determined by the tallness of that box, which is actually the um, subcarrier signal phase shifted. So, uh, let's 
yeah. So we have our white, and then we have our yellow, which is not a highly saturated yellow, really. And because that yellow isn't very highly saturated, and neither is the blue after it, those are kind of short, um, well, we're going to call them boxes again. But there's the yellow, there's the blue. Uh, the light blue and they step down from there more but um, it looks like the saturation is higher for the uh, blue than it is for the yellow so the intensity or amplitude of this wave is different going back to the vector thing if we're trying to draw a yellow we would go, let's say, 135 degrees out of ship, out of phase with the original signal. So that would mean, eh, say the original signal is this one, then the phase shifted one would be a full phase out and then some. So it would be like, this, I think. Uh, yeah. And no. I'm so bad at this. <laughs> but the starting point would be 135 degrees away from the new point. And that's just like the spacing around, the spacing over. So this line would be out to like here or something and that's where the subcarrier would start for the um for the yellow signal so um by doing that you can determine the angle around a circle that your like trajectory or that your triangle needs to take starting from this section here uh and so you calculate your phase shift and then you add your um, amplitude and you get your hue and your saturation and the saturation is the amplitude and the hue is uh, the phase shift and so 360 degrees around the circle gives you all of the colors that you would want and of course, because white is at the very center, or like gray or monochrome is at the very center, if you have no amplitude for your subcarrier color thing, then that means that you just show a gray or white or black or whatever there, based on the pure voltage of the signal. Um, so hopefully that kind of makes sense. I know it's a lot to take in, especially if trig isn't your thing. Um, but yeah, this took me quite a while to figure out. Um, but yeah, that that's um that's how these colors work. And so going back here for a moment. Let's see if there's something I forgot to talk about. I'm sure there is. Oh, one one neat thing that I can show you now is just some stuff about this test pattern. Um Originally, my idea for the video, for what I was going to do, was just, I'll show them how to calibrate to color bars. Um, so, let's get started with that. First thing you do, well, let, let's center all the controls first. Just, uh, get everything good and wacky. Okay, so, now we'll tighten up the aperture a bit. There we go. So, and then I'll crank up brightness. So you can see um, down in this corner, there's these three bars. That's called the pluge, the picture lookup generator, um, P-L-U-G-E. And um, there's a very dark black. There's this middle blackish thing, and then there's a lighter black. And because of tolerances on TVs in the 1950s, um, a pure black is actually not zero volts. Um, it's 7.5 IRE, which is, it basically, 
if I have this right, and I might not, it means that like 7.5% above black from the, like between the maximum value in black is actually what we consider black. And that's so TVs can have manufacturing tolerances and still sync to stuff. And it just made things easier for them. But that means that whenever you're doing these color bars, you want to be sure that these two bars look identical. So this one and this one. They want to, you want them to look identically black. And then you should still be able to make out the lighter one ever so slightly. So let's see if I can get this visible on camera. Yeah, so you, you, I can just barely see, at least on my monitor with this camera, this bar is ever so slightly brighter than these others are. And these others are completely indistinguishable. And that's good. That's what you want. And you mess with the contrast to get it as bright as you would like the maximum brightness to be. And then you make sure that the plooge looks okay. And once you've done that, you get to mess with the color stuff. And you can do that with the color enabled or with the color disabled. I just disable the color to make it a little less distracting. Because I had to brighten up the picture so much to see that. So now that you've done that, the next thing you need to do is to get all the colors looking right. And th this can be tricky. So let's turn it into a monochrome signal here. Or not monochrome. We're actually looking at just what the blue electron gun of the TV is painting on the screen. So the blue pixels only. If um, you don't have a TV that lets you do this, you can either unplug the red and green signals, which I don't really recommend because you have to dig around inside the TV set to do that, or you can um, alternately, uh, or alternatively, you can get a sheet of gel, like a deep blue gel for like stage lights and stuff maybe. Um, and it has to be the right kind of blue, and I don't know what that is, unfortunately, off the top of my head. But um, there are some old, like, calibration kits and stuff. Actually, this um, laser disc that I have here came with one originally. I just don't have it. Um, but it originally did come with a blue gel so that you could do that, I believe. Um, it might not have, but I'm pretty sure it did. It's all in Japanese, so <laughs> a little bit tricky. But there were commercial products and stuff for that back in the day. You might be able to find those. Alternatively, I'm, I know I've looked up before what the blue gel is called. I just can't find or remember it right now. But um, anyway, you can overlay that on top of your TV and... Um, do it like that and that should ideally filter out everything except for the blue so Anyway, once you have the the blue separate out however you can mine is a professional modder that has a blue check button Which I can press for that on Sony PVMs and stuff it the blue check button gives you a white monochrome picture Which is absolutely fine. It's a little bit funky, but it's not wrong to do that Oh, and look, when I turn color off after I've enabled the blue check, then you see this, because now we're looking at grayscale picture, which means that the red, green, and blue guns are all the same intensity. So that, that's just kind of a neat side effect of that. Anyway, so what you need to do now is you look at these bars here, and this bar and this bar need to be identically um, bright. And looking at the color signal you can see that this bar and this bar have their complements um, down below them on tiny little strips like this blue is this blue and this whitish gray is this whitish gray so going back to the blue check um, we also need to do that with this set of bars and I believe you do phase first which means you do the center set of bars first and on some TVs that's called the tint control, on some it's called the phase control or the hue control. Um, mine calls it phase because it's a professional 
equipment. Um, and once you've done that, the then you do the sidebars. Um, so you can see I've cranked up the chroma, which is the saturation control, or the color control, so that you can see um, more dramatically the difference. But if I recenter the chroma control, it's almost perfect. Just a slight tweak. And now the brightness is identical for the top and bottom bits on either side. And once you've done that, you can pop the blue check off and you have proper brightness because you've set the pluge and you have proper color adjustment because you have balanced out the hue control and the saturation control properly. So congratulations, once you've done that, um, you have good color bars to work with. <laughs> um, eventually that becomes kind of second nature once you've done it enough. But, oh, one other thing to note is when you do that, your TV should be warmed up. So like this has been on at least half an hour. Um, and people recommend like half an hour. Even with LCDs, you shouldn't do it right away. But that was more important with fluorescence than now. Still, if you're trying to get it actually good, like as good as you can, then you should do it once the TV is pretty solidly warmed up. And that could be even an hour on some old worn out tubes. But just do your adjustments when it's warmed up or it will drift back out of alignment um, as it continues warming up. So yeah, there's your color bar set up. Um, and again, the oscilloscope picture. So to summarize what I've just been talking about with the Entia signal, the subcarrier is referenced here, and that's where the internal generator and the TV latches onto. And it then compares its internal reference signal to the phase of the signal that's encoded on top of the black and white picture with these little like stair steps and stuff. And depending on the intent on the um, intensity or amplitude or voltage of the um, of the waveform, you get the saturation and then how far out of phase with the reference signal is it is gives you the hue. So um, and you look that up around a circle, basically. Um, I hope that kind of makes some sense for you now. But I'm trying to think what else there is to talk about, really. I mean, there is stuff. Like, S-Video um, separates out the, the um, hue and saturation information from the brightness information. So it's basically the same as this, except you don't get the DC offsets, which are like basically how the luminance is determined by like the center point of this waveform. That's the brightness level for the picture. So there's brightness, hue, and um, saturation. Hue being what color is it, saturation being how colorful is it, and brightness being how bright is it. And um, those three bits of information give you your video signal. And they're all encoded in one smaller signal. Now I remember what I was going to say. They, have, they had to make it backwards compatible with existing black and white TVs. So for that reason, again, if you look at a color picture signal on a black and white TV, you get this dot crawl. And actually, um, as an interesting side note, um, the BBC in the 1960s um, lost, well, they wiped a whole bunch of their TV shows um, to recycle the tapes because uh, the tapes were expensive, basically. Um, and especially once people were moving to color, old black and white content wasn't wanted anymore. But even after that, in the color age, a lot of color stuff got wiped. Like, um, BBC wiped its copies of Monty Python's Flying Circus. They only survived because Terry Gilliam had gotten copies of all of the episodes before that happened. But, um, so Terry Gilliam, uh, the cartoonist for Monty Python and later film director in his own right, um, saved the day there for that particular show. But there were occasionally black and white film recordings that the BBC would make to send out to other countries around the world for them to broadcast, because not all, not all these other countries used like PAL 50 hertz video signals 
and so it was just way simpler for them to send out a film reel have the um have this have the tv studio project the film and then aim a camera at the projected film basically and broadcast that way usually unless uh, they specifically requested it and maybe maybe even in other cases um, the BBC would only sell them in black and white, even if it was originally a color TV show. But um, because of this, um, sometimes the BBC forgot to add this filter thing that basically did what color TVs do internally and smoothed out the chrominance information. And so there are copies of these films that survived that have this color information in them still it just looks like a black and white film picture so if you can detect the correct phase what the original reference subcarrier waveform was and what phase it was then you can compare that to what's happening on the screen and based on that you can reconstruct the color information that was otherwise lost because it was still buried in the signal as this checkerboard pattern I think that's crazy, but it's 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 so cool that they were able to do that. Um, <sighs> might be able to even find it. Yeah, this is what they called it. Yeah, chroma dots. That's what Wikipedia calls it. But yeah, so they were able to take the original picture, turn it into a black and white picture with chroma dots, and then they were able to reconstruct the original picture out of that. And I'm guessing they like average the phase of everything across the picture to try to figure out what the original balance was, but I don't know. Um, it's not just in PAL video that you see that though. Uh, reconstruct the original color signal from black and white recordings. And so that's a way to actually recolor stuff pretty legitimately. Um, yeah. Depending on whether or not dot, chroma dot patterning is present and the quality of the black and white recording. Yep, that's about right. But sometimes you can reconstruct color from something like this because, well, <laughs> that's just how it works and um so yeah i i think that's the last little factoid i had to give you oh yeah one other thing the um source of your color bars matters so not everything is capable of outputting like the correct black levels especially um where one is blacker than black like zero ire there's 7.5 ire which is normal uh black which is like 7.5% or something. And then there's the higher brightness. But not all um, devices are able to output blacker than black. And so sometimes if you're seeing all three bars there in that bottom section, that means that the blacker than black, um, well, that everything's been off, been shifted upwards. And so it's not actually going to match for other sources. Um, I think the N64 might be able to do it. Um, I know for a fact the Famicom can do zero IRA picture and the NES, therefore, but they can't really do all the other color generation properly to get good color bars. Um, a Laserdisc is a good source of them, and I think there might also be some standard DVDs with test patterns on them for that as well. But yeah, I have a Laserdisc player that I use for it. Um, some Criterion Collection laser discs came with color bars on them. Um, if you get color bars that don't have this stuff at the bottom, you can still use them. Uh, you just have to um, note that you just have to kind of visually balance out what's on either side without these handy references below them. But it is possible to do it with those. Because uh, it's still the same thing where you're trying to get all these bars to look level in brightness, uniform in brightness with each other. Uh, yeah, Criterion Collection laser discs sometimes have them, usually even. Um, and yeah, that, that's just one way you can do it. 
So I think that's everything. Let me know what I missed in the comments. Let me know what I was completely wrong about in the comments. Uh, let me know what I was right about or what you didn't know. Just, I really like interaction with my videos because, well, I just like knowing that people are paying attention <laughs> and also that I'm helping someone that makes me feel really good and encourages me to do more of these because I'm not making any money off of this. But, um, yeah, I do this because I like to, and I'm happy if other people get to enjoy it too. Uh, but yeah, that's how color bars work, and that's how NTSC video works. And please let me know what you think. See you around.